again. I'm back. Now we're going to talk about the second half of this lecture, which comes from chapter 27. So we're going to talk about musculoskeletal conditions and immobility. Musculoskeletal conditions, there's many, many that exist obviously that can cause immobility because you need your muscles and your bones to stay mobile. The first one I'm going to mention is a sprain. A sprain is an injury that happens to a joint that causes muscle and ligament damage. Usually the most common place where you see a sprain is your ankle, a sprained ankle. And I know you've heard this term before. I've heard it, we talked about it a couple of times when we do the um, Zoom meetings for lab. And the term is RICE, R-I-C-E. And that's how we treat a sprain. The R means rest. So don't bear weight on that joint if there's any pain. So you rest the sprained ankle. I is ice. You want to apply ice to the affected joint for the first 48 hours. It's going to lower the pain and it's going to stop with the swelling. Remember, ice causes the veins and blood vessels to constrict. And when it constricts, there's less edema or swelling. The C in the rice is compress. You apply compression stockings or an elastic bandage, an ACE bandage, to compress the joint and prevent swelling. And the E is for elevate. Raise the joint above heart level. That's going to get the blood flow going back to your heart, decrease the pain and swelling. The second condition is a fracture or a broken bone. A fracture can range from being a hairline, fra a hairline fracture where the bone remains intact, but there's a thin break, but it doesn't extend through the bone. Or the fracture could be a large fact. <clears throat> Let me start over there. The second thing is a fracture or a broken bone. It can be a hairline fracture where the bone remains intact, but there's a thin break, but the break doesn't extend through the bone. Or it can be a very complicated fracture where the bone is splintered into pieces. Third thing that can happen with the musculoskeletal system is an amputation. That would be when a limb or part of a limb has to be surgically removed. First, let's talk about joint replacement surgery, which would commonly be a knee or a hip. In order for any musculoskeletal injury to heal, it has to be immobilized. We have many devices that are used to immobilize muscles and joints. We have what's called an abductor pillow. Remember, abduct means to take away or to move apart. So it's a wedge-shaped pillow that's put between the legs of a patient who had a TKR, which is a total knee replacement. The pillows keep the knee abducted or apart. It will probably have Velcro strips that keep the pillow in place. Otherwise, it would be sliding all over the place. And if you look on page 563, there's a picture of that figure 24. A cast is a plaster of fiberglass encasement of a limb. The picture that I have in here is a spica cast. That's a cast that's used for hip dysplasia in children, where the cast encases or encircles the hips 
in one or both legs. Casts are used less frequently these days because walking boots and splints are more comfortable, they're removable, and they cause less pressure and edema. Elastic wraps and bandages are used. If you look at page 571, which is often a different chapter, but that's where it is, skill 27.3. Amputee compression stockings or a shrinker, usually we call them shrinkers. They fit snugly over a stump to decrease the edema so the stump heals in a shape that's gonna fit into the prosthesis. If it heals without a shrinker or a wrap on it, it will probably be irregular and too big and won't fit into the prosthetic device. An immobilizer is a boot with Velcro closures that keeps the injured feet or ankles from flexing. There's splints. Splints are just firm plastic forms that keep a joint from flexing. You slip it beneath the injured limb and wrap it with gauze or an ace bandage, and it immobilizes the injured area. A good example of a splint is if I broke my finger and I wanted to immobilize it, I'd get a popsicle stick, put the popsicle stick on it, wrap it, and then I wouldn't be able to bend my joints. A brace, a brace is an orthopedic device that holds joints or limbs in place. The last thing I'm gonna mention is traction. Those are devices used to pull musculoskeletal injuries into alignment. There's skin traction and there's skeletal traction. Skin traction uses ropes, pulleys, and weights to align the bones after a fracture. There's a metal frame up over the bed that supports the traction device. The patient's limb is supported by like an elastic bandage or a sling, and then it's attached to the ropes, and that's attached to a weighted pulley if you look at figure 27.2 on page 501. Skeletal traction is applied directly to the bone through surgically implanted or applied wires, pins, tongs, and rods. The picture shows a man in halo traction. Now I just wanna talk about the care of these devices. First of all, let's talk about casts. One of the biggest problems with having a cast on is it causes intense itching. It, that happens because dead skin cells under the cast can't flake off, they have nowhere to go, and this leads to the itching. When you have an itch, you wanna scratch it, and if you can't get down there to scratch your skin, you have a tendency to use anything you can find, maybe a coat hanger, maybe a pen, anything. A back scratcher, but encourage patients not to do this. It's going to cause skin abrasions and skin breakdown, and that can lead to infection. Don't forget that that skin is enclosed in a warm, moist environment underneath that cast, so it becomes a breeding ground for infection. Suggest so that you use, take a hair dryer and put it on cool setting and just blow cool air into the cast. It's gonna blow away some of the dead skin cells and help relieve the itching. If someone has a cast on, you want to assess their circulation and do what we call neurovascular checks. That's skill 27.1 on page 570. They should be done every two hours for the first 24 hours, then every four hours, and etc. as long as things are going along as planned. 
check the affected limb and compare the finding with the unaffected limb. So when I check your left leg that's in a cast, I'm also going to check the same thing on your right leg that is not in a cast. So check for numbness and tingling. Check for sensation, use a paper clip, see if they can feel it. Look for edema. Touch the skin at the distal end, see if it's warm, if it looks the skin looks pink, dry, and intact. So if I had a cast on from my knee to my ankle, to my foot, and all that was showing was the toes, the distal end is the toes, and that's what I'm looking at. Check for CRT. Have the patient move their toes. Palpate the pulses, assess for pain on the one to 10 scale. Another thing you can do is pedal the outer edges of the cast with tape, because sometimes when a person has a cast on for a length of time, it begins to crumble or crack, and pedaling it will prevent skin breakdown. You won't have the irritating rough edges of the cast rubbing against the bare skin. The next thing is traction. Again, traction can be skeletal or it can <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to start over. Nursing care of traction. Skeletal traction, where you have the tongue, pin site care. You want to do diligent pin site or tongue site care to prevent infection. So where the, the traction is inserted, like say it was here in my skull, you want to clean that area using sterile gauze soaked in normal saline or hydrogen peroxide. Look at the pin sites for signs and symptoms of infection. What are those? I know you know, but since you can't tell me, I will. That would be redness, warmth, pain at the site, edema, and purulent drainage. A small amount of serous sanguinous drainage is normal at a pin or tong site. Don't be alarmed. By that, I mean sero is like a serum or thin fluid, and sanguinous would be blood, so that would be a blood-tinged discharge. Purulent drainage is pussy and, and thick. That would be a sign of infection. You need to take care of the traction equipment. This could be for skin traction or skeletal traction, usually skin. But assess that the weight at the bottom of the bed hangs freely. You don't want it to rest on the ground. Make sure that the ropes pull in a straight line. You don't want one, ro one rope crisscrossing another. And always check the skin for breakdown under the traction device. So look under the sling at the person's leg. You want to make sure that the object of the traction is being carried out and the body is always properly aligned so the traction pulls properly. If you're turning a person in traction, skin traction, one, you need two nurses. One nurse is going to have to lift up the weight. You're not going to want to pull turn the person while that weight is pulling on his limb. So one nurse lifts up the weight so that there's some slack on the ropes. The other nurse turns the patient. Once the patient is in good body alignment, the first nurse gently and slowly releases the weights so they hang freely. Another thing that you see commonly in nursing care are joint replacement surgeries. 
First, we'll talk about a total hip replacement, or it could be called a total hip arthroplasty, same thing. Traditional knee replacement surgery, the head and neck of the femur, remember femur is that long bone in your upper leg, the head and neck of the femur will be replaced with a titanium implant that fits into a titanium lined acetabloomin cup. I said that wrong, I gotta say it again. Hip replacement surgery, also called a total hip arthroplasty. And traditional surgery for hip replacement, the head and neck of the femur is replaced with a titanium implant. And the cup of the hip, the acetabulum, is also lined with titanium so that when you fit the femur into the cup, it's all titanium lined. You can see a picture, figure 27.3 on page 562. When you're caring for somebody that's had hip replacement surgery, you want to make sure that an abductor pillow is properly positioned. You don't want the affected leg to move to the midpoint of the body or beyond. Assure that the abductor pillow stays in place when you turn the patient. As a rule, the patient will not be turned to the operative side during the immediate post-op period. You want to make sure the patient is taught not to lean forward when they're sitting. Leaning forward can cause the hip to flex beyond 90 degrees that could lead to the hip becoming dislocated. If you look at page 563, you'll see figure 27.5. And make sure that when the patient gets up from a sitting position, he also doesn't lean forward. So if he's getting up, he wants to get up that way. You don't want him leaning like this to get up. That could dislocate the hip. The other common joint replaced is the knee. That would be a knee arthroplasty. You could have a TKR, which is a total knee replacement, or you could have a PKR, which is a partial knee replacement. In this case, the top of the tibia and the lower end of the femur are replaced with a metal implant, titanium. The patella, which is your kneecap, is replaced with durable plastic polyethylene. A partial knee replacement may also be done where only one side of the tibia and femur are replaced. You have a quicker recovery, but it may require surgery again at a future date because it may, may not be totally successful. A CPM, or a continuous passive motion machine, if you look on page 570, it's skill 27.2. The knee replacement joint is exercised very soon after surgery. The CPM machine is placed on the bed and it's connected to a power source. The patient rests his legs on the platform Line, that's lined with sheepskin. The sheepskin prevents skin breakdown. The machine is set to the degree of flexion ordered by the doctor, and then you turn it on. And the machine will automatically flex that joint. The amount of time the machine is on, the degree of flexion, and the speed of flexion are gradually increased per doctor's orders. You, before using the CPM, you may need to manage the person's pain. If they're still in a lot of pain, you would medicate them about 30 minutes before using the CPM machine. 
You set the degree of flexion, make sure it matches the doctor's order. Follow the doctor's order for how long the CPM machine will be on and for when and how much the flexion should be increased. When somebody has had total knee replacement, you want to assist them out of bed with an assistive device, probably a walker, as soon as possible. They get people up very quickly after knee replacement surgery, usually the shift when they come back from surgery. Reason being that evidence-based practice has shown that bed rest for somebody following orthopedic surgery has an even higher risk of developing deep vein thrombosis. So it's really important to get them moving. Have another person with you the first time you get somebody out of bed after surgery, not just knee surgery, any surgery. And follow closely the doctor's orders for the amount of weight bearing he wants the person to have on the limb that was just operated on. Maybe only partial weight, whatever. Follow the doctor's orders. Nursing care after amputation. If someone has had an amputation, you want to assess the incision. Are the edges of the incision approximated? Approximated means that the incision meets and aligns in the middle. You don't see any gaps or spaces. Count the sutures and staples to make sure something didn't pop. Watch the incision closely for any signs of infection. And you want to make sure to wrap the stump with an elastic, bland, an elastic bandage or that compression sock, that shrinker sock post-op, so that it's going to heal in a round, smooth shape that's going to fit into the base of the prosthesis. You don't want it healing swollen and jagged. Then it would never fit. You can see that on page 5. 71 skill 27.3 and provide emotional support. It's very, very emotional for a person to lose a body part. They go through deep trauma. Listen, let them vent. Don't take it personally if the person is angry. They have a what we would call in nursing diagnosis a distorted body image now and they're more they're in mourning they're mourning the loss of a part of their body so it takes a lot of time understanding and probably therapy when a person's had an amputation there's a lot of assisted devices assistive devices are used that would be crutches, walkers, canes. They're used when people cannot ambulate independently. The physical therapist is going to teach the patient how to use these devices, and the nurse reinforces the teaching. Crutches. And crutches are used when the patient can't bear weight on unaffected limb, one limb. To fit properly, there should be a three finger, three finger breaths between the axillary pad, that's that cushion part of the crutch, and the patient's axilla when they're standing. You want to teach the patient that it's important to bear the weight on their hands and wrists not to put their axilla directly on the axillary pad. That can lead to damage of the axillary nerves. They'll be compressed, and it can cause nerve damage in your arms and hand. Walking upstairs with crutches, that's an adventure. Personally can't do it, but some people can. But what you're supposed to do is place your unaffected leg on the stair first, then move up the crutches and the affected leg. Walking down the stairs, 
Place the crutches and affected leg on the stair first, and then bring the unaffected leg down. Or hold onto the handrail with one hand and carry your crutches in the other. Stair climbing with crutches is a skill. It definitely is. It takes a lot of physical training, physical therapy training. You can assess the crutch walking gait if you look at table 27 too, it'll explain that. Teach the patient to always keep the affected foot slightly forward so as not to flex the knee. If you flex your knee when you're walking on crutches, especially if you flex it too much, you're probably going to lose your balance and you're going to fall. Canes. There's two types of canes, single-pronged and multi-pronged. There's a picture in your book, and I think there's a picture in this outline of different kinds of canes. Canes are used when the person can bear weight on the affected side, but needs extra support. So they have a weak left leg and a strong right leg, but they need more support. The correct height of a cane, the top of the cane should be even with the patient's hip at the handle. So the handle of the cane should come to your hip when you're standing. The tip is going to be positioned four inches away from the side of the foot. So you don't want to hold the cane right up next to your body. Teach the patient to stand straight and not to lean over the cane. That can cause him to lose his balance. And this is the way you do it. You move the unaffected leg and cane forward. So your good leg and the cane go forward. And then the affected leg comes through. And then you repeat it as you walk around. Unaffected leg and cane followed by the affected leg. Walkers. Walkers are used when the patient can't fully bear weight. Excuse me. Walkers are used when the patient can bear full weight, but they need some assistance with balance. They may fall if they're just walking on their own. See figure 27, 7 on page 566, and there is a picture of one type of walker. To be the correct fit for the person, the top of the walker should come up to the hip joint. The patient should bend their elbows at a 30 degree angle and grip the handles. Teach the patient to stand between the back legs of the walker when they're using it. You don't want to stand too far back so that the walker is way in front of you. That can affect the balance and the person may fall. When using walkers that need to be picked up, the ones that don't have wheels, the patient should pick up the walker, set it down, and then step forward. Don't just walk and carry the walker. That's not going to help. Rolling walkers. Rolling walkers you see a lot at home. I know a lot of physical therapists don't like them. They don't think they're as safe because the patients forget to lock the wheels and that can lead to an injury. So it's really important to teach the patient to set the brakes. Those are the handles on the side and you pull them downward to lock them and upward to unlock them basically. Make sure the brakes are locked if moving from a sitting to a standing position because what's going to happen if they're not, the person's going to grab a hold of the walker, they're going to go to stand, and the walker's going to push out away from them. If one leg is weak, the weak leg should be moved with the walker, and then the strong leg should be moved forward. The last thing I want to talk about is the gait. According, what is a normal gait or the normal way we walk? 
according to the Morse scale, a normal gait is characterized by the patient walking with their head erect, their arms swinging freely at the sides, and striding without hesitation. That person has no fall risk, and they get a zero on the Morse scale. A weak gait, if you have a weak gait, the person is stooped, so their spine is a little stooped, but they're able to lift their head when they're walking without losing their balance. They can lift their head, but their steps or her steps are short, and the patient may appear to be shuffling. A weak gait is a fall risk, so they would get 20 points on the Moore scale. A person with an impaired gait has difficulty getting up from a chair. He may attempt to get up from the chair by pushing on the arms of the chair or by bouncing several times, almost trying to get his momentum so he can stand up. The patient's head is down and he watches the ground when he ambulates. Because he has such poor balance, the patient grasps onto furniture, a support person, or an assistive device. This patient cannot walk without some form of assistance, and that would be 30 points on the Morse scale. So, Again, if we were in lab or if I had another person here, I could demonstrate this. But to assess a person's gait, you want to ask the patient first to get up from a chair. So you're observing them to see if they can get up from the chair in a steady motion without using the arms of the chair or bouncing. You want to have them stand on both feet without moving or holding on to anything for 30 seconds. We'll see how their balance is. Then you tell them to walk a little bit ahead and go through a doorway. Once they get in the door to make a 180 to a 360 degree turn so that they're facing the chair again. Have them walk straight back to the chair and then return to the seated position. While the patient is performing all these activities, the nurse observes his gait and balance. First of all, does he require support getting up from the chair? And does he need support when he returns to the seated position? Does he have a hard time maintaining his balance when he's standing for 30 seconds? Does he seem to have a problem with balance when he's walking? What well, you'd notice then is that he lurches or takes short shuffling strides. You want to notice if there's any change in gait pattern when he walks through the door. Is there any change in gait pattern when he turns? Does the patient hold his head up when he's walking or is he looking at the ground? You want to notice if the person's walking, if he tries to grasp onto furniture or other people, maybe even just the walls as he ambulates. By looking at those things, then you can go back to your Morse scale and see if the person fits into normal, weak, or impaired gait. So that is it for our lecture, our lecture on activity and mobility. And remember, a body in motion stays in motion.